Welcome to the second annual Leadership in Real Estate Lecture. I'll be introducing Bob Buchanan shortly um, as, our, as our guest lecturer, but I want to talk just a minute about who sponsored, who's sponsoring this and why. The lectures are sponsored by the Center for Real Estate Entrepreneurship. The center is a George Mason Center. Uh, I direct the center, uh, that's why I'm up here. And uh, the center is, is, has a very important function. It is the bridge between the real estate industry and the master's program in real estate development here at George Mason, which is headquartered on the fourth floor upstairs. Um, the master's program is a two-year, well, 36 credit, takes longer than two years if you go part-time, which most of our students do. But it's a very rigorous 36 credit program in real estate development. Uh, we take pride in training dirt developers, people who can take a piece of land and transform it into a award-winning building. And the industry, of course, is very important in the education of our master's students. And the center was created to marshal the forces of the industry and feed it into the curriculum uh, and the education of the students. Um, I'd like to brag a little bit before we go on. The students uh, at Mason are in the audience, and if you want to talk to anybody about what happens in the program, I'm sure they'd be happy to. We're very proud of our students, and, and uh, I think they'll say good things about the program. If you're a student at Mason's master's program in real estate, raise your hand. Oh, look, see, they're very attentive, too. Thank you. Um, once a year, the once a year, uh, NAAP <coughs> sponsors uh, the NAAP Challenge, which is a competition between all the master's programs in real estate here in the nation's capital. And it's a crowded space. There's ourselves, Hopkins, Georgetown, Maryland, and American. And every year they have a competition. The students have to create over a three to four week period uh, using an actual development site. This year it was in uh, Bethesda on Wisconsin Avenue. They have to create a pro forma and a concept plan and a, uh, an analysis of the site uh, and a real project uh, uh, plan. Um, and every year they, the students in, from each team present that plan to the judges and the, and the site owner and a, and a best plan is, is, is picked. And for the second time in three years, Mason won. So. Uh, <laughs> We, they won because we have bright students. Thank you. Um, now, uh, before I introduce Bob, uh, I just want to note that there are some important people in the audience. Ken Reed, Loudoun County Supervisor, is here. Thank you, Ken. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the Cree Board, uh, the Cree is an important entity, and we have a number of board members here who help us run Cree. Uh, Brian Benninghoff. Thank you, Brian. Mark Hassinger. Mark is here. Oh, there. Uh, John Crockett, John, and Roger Lynn. Hope I didn't miss anybody. Thank you, Doc. Without, without the board, we don't have Cree, and without Cree, we probably don't have uh, a student body. Uh, finally, uh, we started this lecture series, Leadership in Real Estate, because we teach a course and are serious about training the next generation of real estate leaders here in Northern Virginia, but it's hard to teach a course in real estate leadership. And, and we figured out after a while that the best way to teach a course in leadership is to find great leaders, particularly in Northern Virginia, and get them to stand up and talk about what they do, videotape it, and show it to the students year after year. So we started this lecture series, and, and I wanted to start it with someone who would set a high bar. And so the first lecture in leadership was Till Hazel. And Till is here, and I want to thank Till for, <clears throat> for setting that high bar. When I told Bob Buchanan who he was following, he said, oh, I'm, I'm not doing this. You know. <laughs> but, but what we talked him into it. Um, so we're here to listen to Bob Buchanan. Now, we all know Bob has led Buchanan Partners for nearly 30 years. Um, it's become one of the most creative 
and ubiquitous real estate organizations in the national capital region. A billion dollars or so in investment operating in 11, jur 11 jurisdictions, 5 million square feet, everything from townhomes in Germantown to apartments in Alexandria, uh, over a Harris Teeter, offices in Loudoun, flex space in Fairfax, mixed use Arcola Center. They're everywhere and they do everything. But that's not why we're here to listen to Bob. We're, list we're here tonight because Bob Buchanan is one of the industry's best and brightest. And several years ago, he recognized, like many of us, that there were problems, looming problems. Obvious ones like transportation, but more insidious ones like sequestration. And unlike the rest of us, he decided and had the courage to do something about it. He created the 2030 Group and single-handedly cajoled the region's leading real estate professionals to join in the effort to use a regional strategy to understand <clears throat> and confront the growing economic failures that we were seeing. As a second leadership in real estate lecture, Cree is proud to sponsor Buchanan's insightful analysis of the current national capital region economy and the reason that regionalism and the 2030 group may be the best antidote to the trends that we see worsening our quality of life. That's a bit negative, but I think Bob has some good things to say. Bob. Well, I don't want to be negative for sure, and I do hope that this can be a casual conversation among us as we talk about what I think are very daunting challenges and as we talk about how we got where we are and, and what our possible escape from the what Steve Fuller calls being dead in the water. Our economy is really not doing what it has and I think underlying my comments will be three things. One, we still live in a great place. We have so many assets to build on, including ourselves. We, in the real estate industry, know what it takes to have an economy prosper. We know what it takes to get a project approved. We know what it is what, that our businesses need to occupy the space we create for them office-wise or industrial-wise. We know what our citizens want to live in, the products, the communities. And we know what our consumers want to use and enjoy those amenities we try to provide in retail. But we are seeing, I believe, more changes, and the pace of those changes today is faster than anything that I can remember in my 40-some years in the real estate industry. But it's the real estate industry leaders, it's people like yourselves, and for those students who may not know exactly what you're going to do when you get this great degree from Mason and how you can apply it. Hopefully you'll get some insights today. Hopefully you'll learn that those of us who may be quote unquote the best and the brightest are just as confused and or bewildered by the tasks before us. Uh, it, is, it is very different. It is different because of the internet. It's different because of the role of the federal government. And I also think it's different because we've had it so good for so long, many of us don't know what it takes to right the ship. We haven't had to do anything. The billions in increased government procurement happened whether we did anything or not. We kicked the can down the road with uh, traffic congestion. We really didn't pay attention to land use issues that could address affordable housing better. And we just assumed that because we were such a great place to live, the best and the brightest would always want to come work, live, and learn here. It belied the fact that we imported more top-end, highly skilled jobs than any other metropolitan region in the country. We imported them. We didn't raise them. So we need to step back and say, OK, going forward, what types of an investment do we need to make to make this economy viable. 
I was very appreciative that the Washington Post decided to run a front page article today knowing that I was going to be talking about this. And it basically said, we're losing people for the first time. They're moving away. They're either not happy with the pace or the congestion or I don't know if rat race would be the right phrase, but, but they're saying there are other places to work and raise children. There are other places to get jobs. There are other places to have a good life. That's the first time that I can remember anybody really put an article like that out for us all to see. So what are we going to do about it, and what do we know, so we're dealing with facts and it's not anecdotal, what do we know we can do about it, and who and how does a process work that we can appeal to? And I would tell you that real estate folks understand it better than most, and many people defer to us and other business leaders don't take the proactive roles in the communities that we do. They don't need to get into the public-private partnership process. They don't need to understand the local land use issues because their projects don't depend on it. But we do. We understand how our communities are different. We understand the assets. We understand where people want to live, work, etc. We need to step up. We need to tell our elected officials how much times have changed. They're slowly getting it in spite of all the calls to action over the years. They're slowly getting it because their revenues are falling. Their tax base is eroding. They're not getting the, the, rev the uh, income that they have, had planned. And they're having to make some hard decisions on how they can balance the budget. They know they can't have tax increases. They know they can't cut too many services. But they're starting to come to the business community and say, we need a little help here. We need some, we need some creative suggestions on how we're going to get through this. So would you want them to go to someone who doesn't understand what it takes to make a community work? Would you want them to go to another politician who told them what they did, not knowing about what our community is all about? Would you want them to go to an academic leader that maybe has some theory but's never been put in practice? No, it's us. But are we stepping up? The answer is no again. So let's try to answer Bob's tough question. Can regionalism turn around our deteriorating economy, deteriorating economy and buffer the unprecedented threats to the nation's capital region and quality of life? Yes, but. And it's a big but. Regionalism, I think, is merely the catalyst to get us together, to get us having the dialogue, to get us to recognize that many of us haven't been to the table, haven't been asked to come to the table, haven't demanded a seat at the table, and many of us have been AOL. We've had it so good we haven't had to do anything. Now I think it's time the public sector, the private sector, the academic sector, the nonprofit sector, the philanthropic sector, we all start talking to one another and saying, okay, if we're going to have this community that everyone says is so great, if we're going to continue to live here, we got to start making some of these decisions, but what should they be, what can we agree on, and how are we going to go about it? It's going to take some money, it's going to take some courage to overcome the politics of a lot of things that have not been addressed. And I'll give you one example. We've had, the, if not the nation's worst traffic congestion, certainly it hasn't been anything but a failed system as far as most of us who have to commute on a regular basis understand. And I certainly don't think it's, it's always either the worst or the second worst or the fifth worst in the country. Do you think there's a regional transportation priority plan that has specific projects in it? No. The plan that came out this year from COG did not list one specific product uh, project. They talked about systems. They talked about process. There wasn't one project to addressing what could change our travel times, our, our, our our commuting patterns. The politics are so 
strained in this area alone that when the 2030 group commi uh, surveyed 45 of the region's top transportation analysts from engineers to transportation uh, co contractors, you name it, the 45 to 50 it, most in the know on our transportation areas. Two things came back. One, no one had ever asked them to give such a report, as in what could be, what should be our priorities on a regional basis. No one's asked us to do that. But, we said, if you could and would, what would your top five be? And they named them, and I'll mention it in a minute. But then they said something that really just says it all. They said, we'll only answer this and follow through with you on one condition, that this survey be anonymous. We cannot have our names associated with the priorities we're going to give you, with the recommendations we're going to give you, because we'll either lose, lose our job or we'll lose our contract with the public sector. How in the world are we going to let that continue? When we know the public is probably united in one area alone, our transportation mess, yet no one will cite a specific priority plan for the region. It's bottom-up thinking. It's local versus regional. And I would maintain that other areas that have a crisis, other metropolitan areas that need to get ahead of us, if you will, need to be more viable, they would figure out what it was that they could do to overcome that. Just because I want to throw out some facts as well as maybe some some uh, innuendo. The five were, from the transportation experts, another river crossing, a stabilized, sustainable metro, fix the broken Maryland Beltway, have more north-south corridors, and have a rapid uh, bus system that has the flexibility and at less cost and create more connectivity among our various jurisdictions. Of those five top by consensus from all these 45 to 50 people, of these five top game changers, only one was included in the priority plan put out by COG, Transportation Planning Board, a sustainable metro. So we've got our work cut out for us. When it comes to affordable housing, I am not prepared to say what percentage of our entitlement process goes into the average uh, uh, residential unit because it varies by jurisdiction. But the jurisdictions need to realize if they're going to accommodate the growth of the workforce in their jurisdictions, they don't really have a viable plan for how that's going to work. And the de there's a, such a disconnect between the development community and the public sector that unless there's a regional come together moment about how we're going to solve that, we're going to be trying to attract jobs, but people aren't going to be able to live here. And that means they'll have to commute in from even further out, which doesn't work either. Lastly, when it comes to our workforce, 50% of the jobs that are being held today in one form or another are not going to be here in 25 years. What are we doing to correct that. How are we training folks like at Mason here, how are we training them for the future to get those jobs to be more entrepreneurial? One of the problems we have is we don't have an entrepreneurial uh, culture. We're so dependent and have been so dependent on the federal government that to be successful in many companies it was to be able to get that government contract. It wasn't to be able to make something, sell something abroad, create, create the uh, the kind of exports. We haven't been exporting from this region. We're going to have to export our ideas. We're going to have to do a lot of things we're not doing now. But we can do it. We have a great workforce. We just need to create a culture that does that. It may take longer than we think. And one of the things that probably upsets me as much as anything is the continuation of our various localities to think they're going to solve the problems themselves. Every jurisdiction that I've talked to over the last year has each proclaimed that they're going to be the most innovative, most forward-thinking, most 
aggressive for the new environment, uh, new economy in our region. How's that going to happen? What are they going to do to do that? Why can't we together figure out who can do what? Where are our clusters that can be created? Just in biotech alone, Maryland's got the wet labs. Maryland has the DNA alley history, if you will. Maryland's got NIH. Virginia's got the IT worker. Virginia's got the sense of collaboration and is looking down the road and saying, hey, Maryland, let's collaborate. Together, we'll have the greatest concentration of IT biotech workers in the country. We'll be ranked third or fourth. Right now, Maryland's in the low high teens and Virginia's in the 20s. Does Maryland want to have Virginia collaborate with them? Maryland tells Virginia, you go away. We, uh, we own the life sciences. So that's a, that's a mindset that's got to change. And I think, again, as we talk about what we can do, we need to realize that so much is changing, so much is different today and tomorrow from what it was yesterday, that if we don't take seriously our role in it, I think it will take some, someone to boot us out of our jobs who does know it and does come in because other regions are getting together. Other regions are doing things like, for instance, in Pittsburgh, they created a venture fund to keep their graduate students in Pittsburgh and to encourage them to invest and grow those businesses that they were, they were studying to, to, to form or, or thinking about doing. We don't have anything like that here. We, don't, we just assume everyone's going to graduate and want to stay and live here. Why would anyone want to live anywhere else? Well, maybe that article today in the Post shook us up a little bit. Another guy who's been shaking us up, but unfortunately, the public sector doesn't believe him as much as they should, and that's Steve Fuller. I would wager Steve Fuller is probably the best known Mason individual over the last five years because he's called it before anybody, and then he's come out with the facts and figures, and he's been right. And all those who've been saying, though that's just temporary or that's not going to last, we don't need to be listening to him, have been proven wrong. So Steve Fuller approached me a, a number of years ago and said, the old guard, the, the Tills, the Sid Dewberries, the John Toops, the, the uh, Dwight Shars, they're moving on. They've done, a, they've done their bit. They're looking and hoping that someone is going to come along and help fulfill, help maintain, help add to that legacy. And he said, as we talked, we, we talked and we said, you know, Till and them did that through the 123 Club. And when I was developing in the 80s and 90s, 123 Club was a legend. 123 Club made things happen that no one thought could happen. And I, I know the students here are required to read the Fight for Fairfax, is that correct? For those of us who are no longer students, how many of you read or know about the Fight for Fairfax? Raise your, raise your hand. Good. That book should be must reading for all of us in our various companies because it showed what a few good people, a few strong individuals were willing to do not to feather their own nest, not to make their project better, but because they knew that Northern Virginia needed to be more of that place that they felt they could do. And they did it. Now I would say 2030 group is trying to maybe be like the 123 Club, only on a region-wide basis. Let me back up for a minute and, and tell you a little bit about maybe how I got into this. And, and the first thing to say is, OK, 2030 needed to have a regional outlook because someone like Steve Fuller was saying, the region is not going to grow like it has without severe consequences unless we start providing for infrastructure unless we start thinking as a region. We've outgrown our capacity for growth, good growth, jurisdiction. We have too many silos, and the silo mentality's got to stop. I bought into that. Then I said to Steve, OK, you, through the Center for Regional Analysis, you have the credibility of, of a Brookings, if you will. You're that third-party academic 
credible uh, provider of the facts and analysis that we all can go to. How do we promote that? How do you continue to do that? What are the things we should be studying? And he said, well, we should be providing the analysis so that the dialogue, the public dialogue, among the region's leaders can be on a, on a factual basis, can be on a, a sustainable basis. It's, it's been analyzed, it's not anecdotal, and it's not uh, with a premeditated uh, finding. And he said, I will provide that, and I'll work with others in the region and other academic areas to help develop that. But you, he said, you've got to bring in the business community. The business community has to rally and be part of the solution because right now I'm hired or fired by the public sector if they don't like what I say. Business community has to demand accountability. Business community has to raise the money for this research to go on and the business community needs to be more involved. So I said, well, how are we gonna do that? You've been around more than I. Who do you see that are the leaders out there that we can enlist? I'm willing to do it, I think it's great. And I'm at that time in my career, which incidentally, Brian Benninghoff and Russ are here. If there weren't people at Buchanan Partners who were picking up the slack that I have created by my spending the time in 2030, I wouldn't have had that ability to, to be as involved as I have been for the last seven years. And I thank Brian and Russ very much for that. But the point I was really trying to say to Steve was, who's out there that are willing to participate? It basically boiled down to just about everybody that we approached that said yes, we're real estate oriented. And some of those who were our detractors took us to task and said, how can this be a balanced group if it's all real estate? Mostly male, mostly white. How can this really work? This, this isn't diverse enough. Well, we went to women in the community who were leaders. We went to government contractors who were the leaders. We went to the tech leaders. You know what they said? You real estate guys understand this. The rest of us don't understand this. We count on you to put the roads in. We count on you to understand what kind of infrastructure is needed. We're not interested. We're here because the workforce is here and we're here because the federal government's here and we could care less about your community issues. The second thing they basically said was, good luck, we'll support you, but we really need to keep a low profile and it's gonna be on a case by case basis. So that's not a challenge to us, but that's a fact of life. We're gonna have to overcome all that. So we decided to embark on a series of, of good research and analysis. We've looked at the things from housing to workforce training to uh, uh, congestion, tr infrastructure, transportation. And we've also looked at governance. And we've enlisted along the way other groups who appeared, I guess, two years ago with me on this panel uh, when we were looking at do hearing the report from Steve Fuller on what it takes to be a global dynamic power. And ladies and gentlemen, the list of those who are global dynamic power are many, and the only reason Washington is on that list is because of the presence of the federal government. We don't stack up too well as a business center. We don't stack up too well as a community that pulls together to solve its own problems. We don't stack up too well in a zillion of those characteristics that are found and common to those other jurisdictions, other regions that want to be players we kind of take it for granted. Having said that, however, we've got great academic institutions, Mason being one of them. We need to get them into the fold. We need to get them talking and demanding more. We've got a great nonprofit community that I've reached out to and because they've approached us and said, we want to be involved in this regional t discussion. It needs to be aware of some of the things we are doing and one hand needs to know what the other's doing. So Steve's call to action got a 2030 group going. We did bring in, and you've been handed uh, a flyer, and you can see the list of our, our members. 
And it is interesting, as people hear my presentation on 2030 and kind of scan the flyer, the first thing they do is they look up and they say, wow, you've really got some heavy hitters on your team. And the second thing they ask is, were you able to raise any money? And that's when they really pay attention to us. We've been able to raise, in our seven year of existence, about $3 million. And it's gone into research and analysis. It's gone into getting some bills passed. It's gone into trying to coordinate the business community to speak as one voice. One of the things that I saw, and it was sad but true, as we tried to become that public-private partnership with some of the region's leaders, had a chance to meet with the two governors, O'Malley and McDonald, and in Mayor Gray's office several years ago. We were the only ones, there's three of us from the 2030 group, we were the only ones invited, and the purpose was, what's all this stuff about regionalism? What's all this stuff you're doing? We hear you've got all kinds of good analysis. What, what, what should you tell us? What, what do we need to know? So I talked a little bit about some of the impacts of the growth. I talked about the lack of infrastructure, and I talked about the need for them to be more hands-on in this region because it was the golden goose and they were taking it for granted. And I said, there's a couple things that aren't working very well. We don't have an authority that implements things like in other areas, implements infrastructure. In fact, our metro system doesn't have a sustainable financial model and our metro system doesn't really have the ability to, to become that, really become that glue that holds us together because it depends too much on a year to year appropriations. You all need to commit to a long-term program and bring in the, your, your counties and your states. We have a, a COG that's the clearinghouse for uh, public improvements, but is not chartered to raise money, is not chartered to implement any of the plans they approve, and is not accountable whether they work or not. That doesn't make sense. We need an authority that can handle that. And most importantly, an authority that thinks regionally. COG thinks bottom up. We need to start thinking top down. I finished and I did my thing and, and, and uh, the first question was, one governor, uh, who I will not mention, turned to one of his aides and says, do we, how much do we fund COG and what does COG do for us? The other governor, and then he looked at the other governor and the other governor went, I don't know. Mayor Gray answered that question, he knew. But the two governors of Maryland and Virginia did not know what COG's role was, nor did they know how much of their budget funded it, nor did they have any plans of being more involved. They were looking for low hanging fruit. We now have three new people in that position. We should be demanding that they get together. We should be demanding that they work together. We should be demanding that the Potomac Ocean get back to a river. The other day, some of you, I think, were uh, at Dulles Matters, a uh, very good program about the need for Dulles to be connected to the other airports, the need for Dulles to be more viable like it used to be. And Governor McAuliffe, who has more energy than all of us in this room put together, incidentally, and who's on a wild kick for economic development, he started talking about another river crossing. He ta started talking about the need for a river crossing to help not only Dulles, but Northern Virginia. And he looked at the, those of us from Maryland and said, you got to get your governor involved. The Cahogan team needs to pick up on this positive change from Virginia, proactively seeking a river crossing. So we've started making the rounds. We've got a good group. We've got a good voice in Steve Fuller, who is I think at his, at his January uh, 5th or 15th, whenever it was, the economic summit, I think it was the first time most of us heard in stunning detail just how bad it was and how bad it was going to stay that way as far as economic development. We're getting jobs, but they're at the low end. We're not getting anywhere near the jobs we used to. It's fallen from 76,500 net in 2004 to 18,900 last year. 
And as Steve says, it ain't going to change much. And if you heard Terry McAuliffe last week at Dulles Matters, he's talking about phase two of sequestration that he's trying to prevent from hitting this coming fall, but he knows some of it will be in, in place and some of it won't be shelved. So it's going to be tough to go to the political leaders and say, we need to have more investment in infrastructure. We need to fix our transportation because they're looking at falling revenues. It's going to be tough to give them the courage to change some of the mix of uses, some of the land use issues. But if we don't, we, we're not going to make it. It's not all these efforts to start entrepreneur, high tech incubator, all these things are not going to scale up in the time frame we need to protect our quality of life. That thing in the paper this morning should have been a very shrill wake-up call. Some people are not happy with the quality of life. Some people are complaining about it and the Post is writing it. And it's not just the ugly developer who's complaining, it's now people moving out. I was at a NAOP uh, uh, event a couple of months ago and I was the only panelist out of five that had not transferred most of their new business out of the area. These were major developers who were seeking to grow their companies in other states and other regions, far from this region. Everyone keeps saying, well, it's going to take a major company to move out before we wake up and we do something about our congestion or whatever it is. It's already happening. There aren't major companies moving out. They're, they're headquartered here, but they're not growing here. They're going to Philadelphia. They're going to the Midwest. They're going other places. And it shocked me because these were people who were big names and had thought it through and just said, we don't see the growth here. And our, our figures here are the worst in our company, and we can't afford to ride this out. So what are we going to do? Well, it's nice to know that George Mason is stepping up. On the uh, early part of March, Angel Cabrera presented a, pr a proposal to the 2030 group and said Mason would like to start an outreach program to various sectors in our community about what it's going to take, what, what the roadmap is to generate a future regional economy that we can live with, that we know we have to have. And we're prepared to reach out to the business community, the academic community, the tech community, the healthcare community, all those key stakeholders. Would you work with us? And I said, of course, we'll work, work with you, but getting all these people in, the, in, in concert is going to be tough. So far, I've reached out to a number of key individuals in the chambers, for instance, in, uh, in various parts of, of our economy that have not been participating on discussions like this. And I'm very pleased that the answer so far has been yes. They're figuring out how to do it. They're figuring out what role they play. And they have some internal battles with some of, the, some of their other members and some of the other chambers. But I think we're going to see the business community getting more proactive. I think, for instance, the chamber, Fairfax Chamber, has come out and said, we need another river crossing. We need better connectivity to suburban Maryland. And they, their members, uh, their member uh, organizations total some 550,000 employees. We need the big guys to be involved again, to care. I think that's a good sign. I think it's a good sign when the Ike Leggett from Montgomery County, Maryland comes to the 2030 group and says, I need better connectivity to Dulles. Montgomery County can't play on the global economy unless it has better connectivity to Dulles. I think it's a good sign when Tony Williams of the Federal City Council calls and says, I want to be part of what the region's talking about this group will no longer just be DC centric. We're all in this together. So the answer to Bob's question is yes, regionalism starts it, but
but then when we do get together and we do detail those handful of projects that we feel we have to do, I think the next hard push will be how do we fund it, who's in charge of it, who's accountable for it, and what comes next. Because this isn't going to be one and two and three and done. This is going to have to be ongoing. We've, we're so fractured. We, it's, it's really sad to see how politics have thwarted the economy more than I would have ever thought in Northern Virginia. There's a bi-county parkway that is being held hostage by basically three delegates in Northern Virginia. And this is a key north-south corridor. In the old days, that wouldn't have happened. Till's strength and Till's ability to get people around him happened at a time when people wanted to and hoped they could be better. Well, we've gotten better, but we've kind of taken that for granted. And I think to get back to being better, we're all going to have to get outside our shell a little bit. One of the things that I've been very involved in over my years has been public-private partnerships. Up the road a little bit is Boston, and we were developing in Boston in the 80s, and Boston really wasn't clicking, and people were worried about a lot of things, and uh, we formed a public-private partnership, the Boston Partnership with the County of Arlington, and it transformed the way I saw to do things in my business. I thought it was good to get involved. It was good for my business for me to be involved more than I ever thought I needed to be. But it did two or three things. One, I got to know the community. So when I went in with a proposal or I went in through the entitlement process, I really knew what the community expected and wanted. I also, by going to those meetings and being involved, they knew what I was capable of doing. I never overpromised and underdelivered. I always knew what I could do, and if I couldn't get it, then I told them I couldn't do it. But they appreciated what we were all trying to do together. The second thing about a public-private partnership is the public sector does get to know who they can trust, does get to know what that voice is within the business community, and then when they have problem areas, they'll come to that business entity and they'll say would you participate here we need your your leadership or we need your vision we need your stick to itiveness would you be a part of our community we trust you so when I started sensing that and I started to realize that that was good for my Buchanan partners team as well as for the community it did lead me to a sense that if you're not more involved in the community you're active in, you're not going to be taken as seriously as you think you should be. But if you do get involved and you do spend the time and you do earn their trust, you will reap rewards community-wide you never thought you would. I'll, I'll give one example because it's such a great one. And Hank Hume was listed, former uh, director of public safety, was on the list of people in the uh, Civil Engineering Institute today that I attended a, a function. And Hank Hume was Director of Public Works when Boston Partnership was getting going, and we were complaining to Hank that we were doing all this stuff to make greater sidewalk amenities and trying to create a sense of walking around the parks and nighttime and whatever, and these crazy VDOT lamps were so glaring and so harsh, no one wanted to go outside because it made them look awful. And I said, you've got to create a bulb. You've got to create a fixture that's amenable to a neighborhood walking. And I said, you can do it. We can't do it. They'll listen to you. Won't listen to a bunch of developers. He said, let's do this. Let's go down to the mall. I'll take some voltmeters. I'll take some of my crew, and we'll walk around, and we'll just see what is down there and agree what we can do, and then maybe I'll do some. So we did. We spent a couple hours walking the mall, got a sense of the lighting, sat down and had a couple beers later, and he said, you know, I think you guys are right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something about it. Called me about a week later and said, Buchanan, you got your lights. Now, I just want to remind you, I really had to do some favors to get it, but I think it was worth it. You convinced me. If I ever call on you, though, I'm hoping you'll remember this. 
Hank, you got me. Thank you. This is great. This will really make Boston be what it needs to be. A month or two later, he called and said, OK, there's a public hearing next week in Fredericksburg. I've put in for a dozen improvements to our intersections in Arlington. Some of, two of them in, are in Boston. But I want you to accompany me, and I want you to make a plug for Arlington's needs and may help me, because I'm right now, I doubt if I even get the two in Boston. The money's tight. So I said, I'll go down with you, but you're going to have to tell me what to say or do, because I am clueless. And he said, you'll be ready. So the hour drive down to Fredericksburg, he's pumping me, and I'm making notes. We walk in to this schoolhouse where everybody is packed. Everybody knows everybody. I'm the only non-public official walking in that door. They call us up, and I said, I'll I'll go up there with you. He said, no, you're going up there. When they ask questions, I'll come up, but you're on your own. You, you can do it. I went up there, and I made my pitch. And I, at the very end, I said, I'm happy to defer any questions to the man who just told you what I just told you uh, through me, because I've, I've ex already exceeded my capacity. No questions. We drive back, and he says, you know, that was pretty good. I'm, I saw the look on their faces. They were surprised. Thank you very much. A week later, he called, and he said, this damn Boston partnership is the best thing that's ever happened to the county. You guys got anything you want. I said, you got two things? He said, I got six things. I never thought I'd get anything, only because you went there, only because this public-private showed those guys were working together did I get what I got. That kind of sustained me to realize we can make a difference if we participate. We can make a difference if we get outside of our shells. We can make a difference if we're willing to spend the time to learn. I hope my career, which was a lot in public privates, is, is not so unique that the rest of you won't try. Uh, and I admit, I did not think I would ever run for anything. And uh, it was only when I ran for office in the city of Rockville, and I was elected as a council person in the 70s, that I did really realize how much and how different the mindset was in the public sector than the private sector. And it used to really bother me to see developers come in and say some things that I found were groundless, and I would take them to task and just say, you know, you can't say that. How is that going to work? And I got a reputation for really caring and trying to do right. And that led to, you know, a lot of uh, strains on my time, but I, I, I became as caring about the community as I was about my company. But the sacrifice to family is huge, and eventually I, I stepped down because I couldn't raise a family and a company at the same time. But I've never forgotten what it's like to have a community that clicks, what it's like to have everybody trusting one, not everybody, but the, the major players trusting and understanding and working together. And I would say, unless we start thinking that way and we take the lead, it ain't going to happen. Real estate guys have insights no other industry has in this town. You know what it takes to make a community. You know what it takes for the process. You know how to get them financed. You know how you, you understand it. But if you don't tell those who need to know, they're going to assume you can do anything. Two nights ago, I was with a, a group called the Committee of 100 in Prince William County. And I was telling Till about it earlier today. There was a citizen activist who was anti-development, distrustful of the local political leaders, and so un naive about and unknowing about how the process works in the market that he he made me look good. He was he was so antagonistic and so misinformed and so out of it that it, you almost didn't have to work hard to refute him. And the room turned when they realized he was demanding things that couldn't happen. When the room realized that he was so anti that he wouldn't do what was right for the community. And they listened to me when I told them how the community needed to change. 
or it would always be a bedroom community. And what, was, what the millennials were looking for. We're at a time where things are changing. Marriott is gonna be a test case, not just for Montgomery County, but every jurisdiction. What does it take to hold that company I can't afford to lose? What are the th criteria that they're gonna be looking at tomorrow that they haven't looked at before, and how do I measure up? And if you don't think Maryland and Montgomery County are sweating bullets, you're crazy. They can't afford to lose Marriott, but Marriott has said, we're still compiling what it is we think we want, but we know it isn't where we've been for 30, 40 years, and we know we have to go where it will be because we have to rely on that workforce that wants to come to Marriott. I think we all need to go to our county leaders and say, that next Marriott, what are they gonna say about us? What do we have to do? I was telling Bob earlier, I probably developed or been associated with more office parks in the suburban area, suburban office park market than anybody. They're functionally obsolete. If we don't really look hard at what those suburban office parks need to turn into fairly quickly, they will continue to lose value. Their real estate return will continue to ebb away at the county's revenues. But God forbid you talk about residential. As Bob says, you use the word residential, they just think that's all you wanted in the first place and we can't afford to have more services with the residents. We can't afford to have more schools. Therefore, we're dismissing it out of hand. You may be right, but we, we don't wanna hear your options. If we don't start transforming some of these things that are obsolete into what they can be to have the flexibility to what, they, what is coming, we are at fault. We know better than county planners. We know better than, I would say, 90% of the public officials. But are we educating them on what their backyard's gonna look like if they don't take action? I don't think so. I was talking to Bryant Folger on the way over and he, he and I were bemoaning the number of organizations that are more about networking and more about service to their members than really being active. And I said, everyone is just so damn politically correct in this town. And he says, that's it. I'm going to, I'm going to make a point of not being politically correct. And I thought, <laughs> I think more of us ought to be that way too. I think more of us ought to participate. I think more of us ought to get involved. I think more of us ought to step out, step up and speak out. You're getting a great education here. Use it. Think regionally. Enjoy a great place to live, work, and play, but don't take it for granted. Thank you.